Welcome aboard. Um, I'm going to jump straight into it because it's pretty packed agenda today. This is the order of the day agenda. Welcome, embracing change. Going to go through some key concepts, some EBAP examples and questions. This webinar, the presenters are in Melbourne and Tasmania, as well as myself. We've got Matt Sullivan and Hannah Snape, who are going to be jumping in from Tassie as we move along. I want to start by acknowledging that the workshop today or the webinar is being held on the traditional lands of the people of the Kulin Nation, the Wurundjeri people in Melbourne, and the Muinina people in Hobart, and would like to acknowledge them as the traditional owners and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and elders from other community, and acknowledge the land that we are having this webinar on is a place of age-old ceremonies and celebration initiation and was never ceded. We're currently in what is known as the late summer, according to the Wurundjeri calendar. And what we're expecting at this time of year is normally hot, humid, thundery conditions, or grassland fires and things dry out. That is quite familiar. However, that hasn't really been something that has been confined to late summer at the moment throughout Australia. Country is literally on fire and the climate emergency is certainly here. So this is very timely. I'm going to cover up on some quick housekeeping. Most of you guys have been here before, but for those who haven't, this is us. Well, that's most of us. We've now a, a, um, a business of about 25 odd people. All we do is work on local government, climate action and sustainability projects. And we've got offices in Tassie, Melbourne, Western Sydney, Brisbane and now Darwin. It's going to be informal today, but not as informal as some of the last webinars from last year because it's no longer December and Christmas and we're sort of all getting back to it a bit. Um, ask any questions as you go along by typing them into the go to webinar question box that you should have in front of you. If we don't get to your questions today, we will get to them at a later stage and develop a report post webinar. Feel free to disagree. There are some ideas in today's webinar that we've certainly found challenging internally and we appreciate there are different views when it comes to fighting climate change and note that this is all been recorded. It's a really big turnout. So this is who is on the line or who registered for today. Uh, any spelling mistakes you see in there are not ours. We've just copied the list directly from our registration report. Um, and we've got a nice mix, majority in Vic, New South Wales, but most states and territories are covered here, which is great. There were a lot of questions in advance. Don't worry about writing these down or having an understanding or a note of them because we will, as always, send you these PowerPoints after the webinar. Um, but this is the sort of questions, these are the questions, the exact questions that council people were asking in advance of today. And these ones here we're going to try and get to today. There were a few as well that were asked that weren't quite as relevant. So if these were yours, we're probably not going to get to them, but we are happy to have a chat offline if you would like. We also asked everyone in advance whether your council has a community-wide or municipal-wide climate action plan. And you had a couple of options. Yes, you've got one, it's developed, current, it's out of date, um, or no, you're developing it or you're planning on or you just don't or you're not sure. Um, it was really interesting to um, receive that survey or to receive the results of it. And we're actually going to jump in and get everyone to answer a quick poll. Now, if you don't know how this is done, it should be quite straightforward, but we want you to guess. What percentage of councils have a current community or municipal wide climate action plan? Jump in and have a guess. So this is those who have a current plan. Give you another 10 seconds, the results are coming through. So this was based on one, ended up being 117, I think, councils or 117 registrations. So it's great to be able to get a really big sample size from the councils that you saw previously all around Australia very quickly. Um, okay, we've got 84% voted, those who didn't vote. Last chance, three, two, one, get it in. Okay. That's the results. Uh, the 42% said 11, 37% said 22, a couple of you said a third and a little bit more than that. 
and here are the results. So most of you were right. 11%, that's the green down the bottom. I'm going to assume that you can now see that slide again and you don't have the poll results. Um, a very small amount of councils currently have an up-to-date climate action plan for the community. A couple have one that's out of date and the majority do not have one. You were right, generally. Well done. Um, finally, here's what you said from our last webinar. This was the snapshot one at the end of last year. And those of you who had questions around community emissions profiles and data, you really should go back and watch that. We had uh, City Power Partnership, Eakley and BZE all in attendance to discuss these things in detail. Um, thank you for that feedback. We note that we've been rushed in the past, so we're going to try and leave a lot more time for questions today. And everyone has been on notice, the Ironbark staff, to prepare in advance and make sure we're okay. There are some issues about the sound quality and we bought a new microphone. Um, finally, at the end of this, we are, as always, going to ask for some feedback. Um, and as well as getting a, all of the PowerPoint presentations, there are some, there's a report with some pretty awesome graphs that you'll receive post-webinar that essentially has a lot of information on what our process is and the concepts that we're going to be discussing. So the evidence-based action planning process. So if you see these things come up today and think, geez, I can't really read that, don't worry, you can read the report at the end and you'll be able to find out exactly what we mean. I'm not saying don't pay attention, but don't worry about missing any of the little details. Okay, this is a walking school bus. My first job at Ickley Oceania in 2003 was working with Vic Health and Ickley through the Cities for Climate Protection campaign to try and develop a business case for active transport and walking school buses. Walking school buses, for those that don't know, it's essentially where it's one person picks up kids and walks them to school. It basically helps reduce traffic, gets kids out and about. It's a great program. I loved it. I spent a lot of time working on, these, um, on this project. In fact, it got to the stage where we even at ICLEI developed an online active transport quantification tool and every year, there's this massive CCP measures report that basically tallied up all of the emission reduction projects from throughout Australia. But in 2006, the old walking school bus was highlighted. So I was chuffed because it was my sort of pet project. Um, there was information on this great action. Um, and I was looking back at it in hindsight and noticing that the project saved 90 tonnes of greenhouse emissions across 22 councils in 2006. And then compared that with the challenge ahead of us at the moment, looking at some snapshot em emissions profiles from some councils, Port Phillip, 2 million, Mount Alexander, 360,000 tonnes per year. That's pretty big numbers. And the walking school bus project reduced emissions over the year by 90 tonnes. It was not a climate mitigation project. It was a fantastic project and it's something that we would strongly encourage councils to get involved in because it does great things for exercise, getting kids out and about, reducing environmental impacts like urban air pollution and it can save money for people getting out of cars. But as we reevaluate and look at the issues that we're up against at the moment, these kind of small or individual actions really are not enough. Throughout this webinar, we're going to be talking about these kind of actions. And I just want to make it really clear, we're not saying at all that they are bad or they're things that we shouldn't be doing because they absolutely are. But when we're talking about evidence-based climate action and when the goal is to reduce emissions as quick as possible, these are the sort of things that won't cut it. And so we're looking at much larger things than that. We're after essentially interventions that can lead to long-term change. So one thing that we've had to do internally, and I would encourage everyone here to do, is to have an open mind. Of course, please disagree. But if you close your mind, and we're wrong with what we're putting forward today, then I guess you can say, I told you so. But if your mind is closed, then you might miss a really good opportunity if we're on the money. If you open your mind up to some of these ideas, the worst thing that can happen is that you'll get your hopes up for nothing. But the best thing we hope is that there's a genuine opportunity to make a real difference. So we would 
ask everybody to open your minds to some of these concepts. All right, I'm now going to pass on to Hannah Snape in the Tassie office. I will remind everyone Thanks, again, Ray. if you would like to jump in and ask questions through the GoToWebinar question box. And Hannah, I'm going to try and change presenter. That's what I need to do, isn't it? I think so. <laughs> Bear with me. But you're down under Matt Sullivan, though, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Please. Okay. There you go. And there you go. Once you share your screen, you'll be ready to go. All right, does that look good? That looks great. Cool, okay. Thanks, Lex. Um, so I'm just gonna run through some key concepts um, that, that, we, that we use in our evidence-based action planning process before Matt runs through some real examples. Um, so to start off with, this is Ironbark's standard process for uh, climate, climate mitigation programs. It's pretty standard project management language if you've seen the kind of aim, plan, do, review type cycle, you'll recognise this. Um, now we're not going to be focusing on the insight or the target phase today. We've done a lot of an, uh, webinars on these already and we've done a lot of talks and so we're assuming some knowledge Hannah, in these areas. Hannah, can I just jump yes? in for a second? I've just got a question here saying are you, can everyone else hear the audio? There's a, one person that can't hear anything, just trying to figure out if it's at their end. Oh. All good. Yeah, you can it out. I'll pass it's it back to you, Hannah. Thanks for that. We've figured it out. Sorry about that. Got it all good? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Do you want me to start that again, Lex? No, you're all right. Go from where you are. Everyone heard okay. it. Sure. Um, so we are assuming some knowledge in those areas and today we're going to be focusing on the strategy step. Now within this step there is a sub process. I know there's a lot of information on this slide. Um, don't worry about writing it down as Lex said, it will all come through afterwards. Um, and within this process we've divided it into three phases. So I'm going to run through the research and quickly through the modelling phase as well today. Essentially, the research phase is about gathering information about emissions in the municipality and about anything that's going to impact emissions into the future. Um, the modelling phase is where we then take that information, we test theories, we make projections, we analyse data and we work out what will and won't work. And then finally, getting through to the delivery phase is really just um, putting that all into something into, that is useful to council. So putting together a plan and a monitoring, evaluation, review and learning program. So first up, the research phase. This is all going to be quite familiar, so I really am going to gloss over this. But if there's anything, if you have any questions, send them through or um, feel free to give us a call after the webinar. First up, the community emissions profile. So this is essentially telling us what, when, where all of our emissions are coming from. Um, it shows us the key sources of emissions and it shows us the scale of the problem that we're dealing with. Then a science drive target. Targets, uh, we've talked about a lot. We understand that a lot of councils have targets but we are talking about targets that are linked to science, which means they are linked to the goal under the Paris Agreement of remaining within two degrees Celsius of warming on pre-industrial levels. And in order to show that, any target must be linked to the carbon budget that's been developed by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And that's all I'm going to say about those. <laughs> Um, now, local context, we're not talking about what the community thinks about climate change. We're talking about things that are going to materially impact emissions. So, for example, understanding that Liverpool City Council in Western Sydney is going to have a new airport coming into operation around 2026 or understanding the budget allocation that's been approved for your council to work with. 
next stakeholder mapping and this is a little bit similar but it's looking specifically at who in or outside of the municipality will be influencing emissions over the coming years and what that impact might be. So for example, in the city of Wollongong, they've got blue scope steel, so a huge industrial emitter. But understanding that blue scope steel, blue scope steel sorry, has a really strong climate and energy policy and are committed to meeting their targets under the Paris Agreement. Or understanding that the state of Victoria, a bill has been passed which legislates a net zero target for the state by 2050 and includes five year interim targets and strategies to meet those targets. Or in any state of Australia, in fact, knowing that the emissions factor is changing year on year and simply by projecting that out and trying to understand what the future trajectory of that emissions factor is, can impact how you see your emissions profile and the efficacy of your actions. Okay, so coming back to this process, I'm now gonna run through modeling. Um, some of these concepts will be a little bit newer to people, so this will just introduce them before Matt runs through everything in more detail and with some real examples. So first up, the first step in this is identifying actions. And by that we mean understanding things that actually reduce emissions. So we've talked about this before, examples of emissions are things like installing renewable energy, building green buildings or using electric vehicles. Uh, and it's the actual act of doing these things. So it's not about the step before where you try and influence them, it's where these things are installed and used. We then need to understand the business as usual scenario for these actions. So that is understanding the idea that if councils do absolutely nothing, those actions will happen to some degree anyway. And we can see this quite clearly in the example of residential solar being installed at great rates on owner occupier houses throughout Australia. Uh, and I think Matt will talk a bit more about that later as well. Now business as usual trajectory usually looks something like this. People will may have seen a curve like this before, sorry. Um, so it looks at the proportion of the opportunity adopted over time. And we can see at the start there are early adopters. It then achieves some critical mass as it increases dramatically. And lastly, it moves towards market saturation. Now I'm going to talk about the difference between market saturation and maximum potential. And to do that, I'm going to use an analogy. I'm going to talk about the MCG. Um, now, in theory, the maximum potential of the MCG, of, of bums on seats in the MCG is 100,024. Now, they they can sell 100,024 tickets, but the reality is that they will not achieve 100,024 bums on seats in the MCG. And the reason for that is simply because there will be other things happening. There will be people that arrive late. There will people be people that leave early. There'll be people that have to go to first aid. Some people might be in the bar, some people might be in the toilet, they might not show up at all. Um, so that's that's the key difference. Matt's gonna may talk through that a little bit more later as well, but that's the key difference between those two concepts. We then need to understand what the market barriers are for the action. So these are the things that are keeping the business as usual trajectory looking the way it is and keeping the market saturation at the level that it is. They're things that stop people taking up an action or they might make it more difficult. So if we go back to this business as usual trajectory, they're keeping it down for in terms of the overall uptake and they might be slowing it down. They're things like 
social norms, poor business case or high capital cost, lack of knowledge, or split incentives. I know that's not a very good picture for split incentives. Sorry, everyone. Um, and then in order to address those market barriers, we then look to identify interventions. So for example, if we're addressing the market barrier of lack of, lack of knowledge, we might look at education. Or if we're looking at a business case issue, we might look at financial mechanisms. We wouldn't do that in reverse though. If the market barrier is lack of knowledge, you can offer all of the loan incentives that you like. It may not address that market barrier. We've come up with 12 intervention types um, that are appropriate for councils to interact in. Again, there's lots of words. Don't worry about writing de these down because we'll send them through a bit later on. Essentially, the intervention is council's role in community emissions mitigation. By undertaking these interventions, they can have much greater impact in terms of the overall actions that are implemented in the community. And in doing so, they can increase the speed of adoption or increase the uptake of adoption of these actions. Uh, now I'm going to throw over to Matt. Matt, before you jump in, um, there's a few questions coming through. Thanks everyone and keep them coming. There's a few around the emissions calculations in the profiles and the um, those emissions snapshots. So I should acknowledge that snapshot was developed by BZE and Ironbark with funding from the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation, Sustainability Victoria and the Department of Primary Industries and Environment in New South Wales. Um, in the follow-up email after this webinar, I will send a link to the with more information on Snapshot if you want to um, get involved and try and answer some of those um, questions. Someone else has asked around, you know, whether we should be doing this at all, when we should be focusing on our own operations. Um, yes, of course, you should be focusing on your own operations as well, so your own corporate buildings, lights, fleet, waste, etc. Um, however, if we are talking about a climate emergency, then we need to recognise that council operations are generally about 1% of the municipal's, municipality's emissions. And so we we really probably are going to see the role of councils and offices changing and, and not so much the implementation of those things. Mind you, a lot of those are sort of lay down the zares and have pretty clear business cases. But when we're talking about the big stuff, 99% of emissions that are out there, it's not so much doing and funding them, but are moving to a role of facilitating, advocating, managing others. And I can point out that Bundaberg in Queensland, their council strategy has some really good examples of how they do that and how they've sort of changed the way that the sustainability team operates. Another question about whether this is going to come up at the Climate Emergency Summit. I've got no idea. We're not talking at it, but we will be there. So i um, happy to come and say hi. Uh, over to you, Matt, um, who is going to extraordinarily keep his thing to 15 minutes. <laughs> Thanks, Blake. Okay. Thanks. So I'm going to go through some of, uh, sort of work through how this uh, applies practically and show some examples and the outputs of those, uh, those examples. So the things I'm going to look at in a little bit more detail are around the market barriers, uh, looking a bit at market segmentation as a tool to understand this, um, how to develop targeted interventions uh, specific to barriers, and then going through the quantification of those. Um, We'll also be looking through some specific interventions, um, solar PV in a couple of applications, building efficiency, transitioning to EVs in the transport sector, also mode shift to like bicycles, uh, the adoption of FOGO and the impact of that, and then uh, considering industrial clean energy. So uh, these, so firstly, I just want to say in identifying market barriers, these are action specific uh, and potentially municipality specific. So the uh, market barriers are understanding market barriers and quantifying them are somewhat uh, a bit of an art to it. Uh, there are uh, different ways to approach it, which I'll run through. The example here I'm giving is uh, developed by the Australian Electric Vehicle Association for electric vehicle adoption. They identified five key barriers, capital cost, infrastructure, the range of brands models available, the functionality of the cars and the convenience of using the car in day to day. These 
barriers all present different challenges and it's worth considering that uh, practically only two of those barriers, the infrastructure or the perception of it and the convenience of use and day to day are the, really the best ones for councils to target. Uh, and we'll talk through the implications for intervention development uh, coming from that. Now, market segmentation is another very useful tool for developing interventions. Uh, the reason being is because it helps you understand how the market's performing well and where it's perhaps not performing as well. And understanding the variation between those can really highlight what actually presents as very, you know, significant opportunities for intervention. So the example I'm giving here is that uh, rooftop solar, again, we're talking specifically uh, about uh, one city in particular, the rooftop solar PV for all residential dwellings. So as in the, the number of the proportion of dwellings that have rooftop solar there is 21% currently, which you may or may not consider high. It actually is it's pretty good. Uh, but when we do a segmentation of that market, uh, we take a look and we see that 34% of that adoption is actually on owner-occupier dwellings. Uh, so, sorry, of the owner-occupiers, 34% have solar PV. And as opposed to uh, renters, so uh, properties that are being rented, uh, less than 2% have adopted uh, solar PV. Uh, this difference suggests that uh, the renters present the more promising opportunity for intervening. Um, I'll step through a little bit more detail some of the numbers behind those, uh, those breakdowns to help further uh, expand upon that. So quantifying market barriers, understanding if we might be able to identify that barriers exist, but it's, it's important to understand that they, these barriers may have very different impacts. And understanding the scale and scope of those impacts is critical when determining which interventions to pursue. So it may be possible to identify the, the impact of those barriers uh, by a variety of means. So for instance, understanding um, how the market is responding for different market segments, particularly say for segments unaffected by the barrier in question. And the previous example between uh, renters and owner occupiers, you know, we can clearly see a very strong difference between those market segments. And that, that provides a clear tool to understand how, um, say, the renters might respond if barriers to adoption were addressed. And also for other um, intervention, other sort of action adoptions, uh, it's possible to look to similar markets in other countries. Uh, the electric vehicle adoption rates are good examples because we can see a broad range of interventions being pursued um, internationally to try and target them. And we can sort of understand what the impact of those interventions might be. However, I would highlight this is actually a great area of research. It's one that we are looking into in detail. Uh, it is very much action and intervention specific. Um, to help understand how this is useful for determining uh, intervention strategies and, and carbon mitigation plans for councils, uh, just highlighting here's a graph. This is showing EV charging use. This is business as usual for the action. So it's showing um, what we're expecting, the impact of this action over time independent of council's activities and uh, how it's how much sort of abatement's being attributed to that. Now, uh, what we're seeing is that around 2021-22, we're seeing key market barriers removed or eroded. Those barriers are around capital cost, the functionality and the range um, of cars. And so we see a substantial uptake begin to take place post that. Um, we're hitting around 50% of new vehicle sales around 2030, which is uh, not what the Labor government has indicated is one of their targets, but sort of we are kind of expecting the market to simply achieve that naturally. Um, now, understanding this market helps us to understand what should we be trying to do about it? What are the opportunities for local government to do something? And so stepping through these uh, barriers, we can see that capital cost is a significant barrier. And uh, one of the key ways of addressing that, one of the ways we see being worked internationally is to provide incentives and grants. Uh, infrastructure and the perception of the infrastructure, so the charging uh, and, and uh, the refueling of the cars, uh, again, another barrier. Um, this could be addressed through incentives and grants. Um, it could be addressed through a direct financing of investment 
But we would uh, recommend that facilitation of uh, the installation of the infrastructure actually should be considered one of the primary uh, uh, types of interventions that local government should pursue. So just basically um, playing the role of uh, enabling the installation of this infrastructure to take place. Um, another market barrier, functionality. There really is no clear intervention for local governments to tackle that. Uh, and this highlights the fact that um, some market barriers really do not, um, aren't accessible for local government to try and address. And in those instances, uh, it may be the case that the best strategy is to wait and see, sort of like sit back and let, uh, or just understand how, how that barrier will be addressed over time and uh, you know, sort of defer um, council intervention strategies until it's addressed. For EVs, we are expecting that functionality to be addressed in the near future, the next couple of years, um, in which case then the other barriers start to become the main um, impediment to adoption, and then that changes the equation and really makes it that councils can start to play a significant role. So uh, what sort of role can they play with EV uh, use? So we would say that um, if councils in the next couple of years looked to implement strategies to facilitate um, the uh, charging infrastructure and to be targeted around convenience of use, then that means what we can see is an accelerated adoption rate of those EVs. And that green wedge is essentially showing the amount of carbon that might be um, offset uh, from you know, carbon budget for the municipality through these interventions, through this specific intervention. Uh, just talking a bit further about um, how to target interventions. If we look at uh, in solar PV, now uh, the market segment owner occupiers, this is previous, this has been a, a popular area to target. And uh, if we take a look at the owner occupier section for this particular city for Central Coast, we've got um, private investments in excess of $40 million per year currently. Uh, that's obviously like a good chunk of money. And it suggests that investments, investment and grant schemes are unlikely to be highly impactful unless they are sort of in that ballpark price range. Um, we are also seeing the characteristics of that market installation rates greater than 4% per annum of total uh, available houses and accelerating at a rate of 10% per annum. Uh, and also um, current projections suggest that market saturation will hit around 80% of complete maximum potential, which is a very good saturation level. Uh, this market saturation suggests that there is a reduced need to influence um, the, the take up. So this, uh, and also because of these rates, these rapid rates of adoption and the current rates of investment, we're sort of, we're expecting to see an effective market saturation achieved in the vicinity of 2030, 31, or maybe a couple of years later. Uh, and this, that's not that far away. So there is a pretty limited opportunity to accelerate that adoption rate. Now to contrast that with uh, the rental market, um, we can see that private investment is currently less than $0.2 million a year. Um, which means that investment and grant interventions could quite well be effective. That's a, that's a pretty approachable uh, uh, size of investment. Uh, the installation rate is slow uh, and we don't, does not appear to be accelerating um, based off the numbers. Because the numbers are so low, it's a little bit hard to tell, but it's not a suggestion of acceleration. Uh, market saturation uh, is currently expected to hit around 5% of the maximum potential for rentals. Um, this suggests a very large amount of opportunity to be targeted uh, to, to see an increase of that market saturation, uh, which again, uh, this indicates a good area to investigate in um, doing interventions. Uh, but even if that was the case, that, uh, so even with that sort of background, it doesn't mean necessarily that council should deliver an intervention strategy here um, because there may be no effective interventions, no identified effective interventions but it's certainly an area that you would want to investigate. Um, so just stepping through that market barrier breakdown, uh, we've seen, you can see capital costs and difficulty of, and difficulty of installation and trust being the two main barriers for unoccupiers. Um, the capital costs can be addressed through incentive and grants, but as we've identified, that may not be that effective. 
Uh, typically, in trust can be addressed through facilitation, so uh, implementing programs that enable, uh, that reduce the uncertainty and risk on individual homeowners to um, pursue solar PV installs. Um, what I would highlight, however, is that um, not all barriers are made equal. We should try and understand how serious these barriers are. The, um, the figures associated with current rates of investment suggest that they are not serious impediments for the large majority of households and that um, producing interventions that may target these market barriers, but that these barriers are only weak barriers for the, for the market and therefore that the interventions will have to be very substantial um, to meaningfully deviate those, uh, the current market performance. Uh, for renters, however, we've got many serious market barriers. We have split incentives, we've got multiple stakeholders involved in negotiations, and we have issues around limited ten uh, tenancy and the impacts on business case. Um, so because uh, these are all operating again with, also within the context of the same barriers that the owner occupiers have, such as capital and uh, uh, difficulties, uh, sorry, um, the trust issues, then that means that uh, facilitation becomes one of the primary tools for targeting this. So for split incentives, facilitation is a great tool. So creating templates, uh, legal mechanisms, uh, uh, contracts that enable those split incentives to be addressed between the stakeholders. Multiple stakeholders are also, facilitation is the key intervention for targeting multiple stakeholders and complexity of negotiation. And also the limited tenancy issue may be assisted through facilitation. Others uh, interventions could be pursued, interventions and grants, again, with the low rate of investment, um, incentives and grants might be quite effective. Um, education could be quite an effective tool in uh, helping to uh, just understand the, the benefits of pursuing a investments on uh, rental properties. Or you could consider new regulations and policies to assist this but we would suggest that facilitation should be considered the primary intervention here. And then if there are other gaps identified with this resolving it, or if we're still dealing with issues of poor take up, then pursuing other intervention strategies might be preferred. Uh, so just looking at the impacts of these interventions. So here is the BAU for this particular municipality for solar, as we can see, that the overall emissions abated with the business usual trajectory is quite large. Um, now, if we did the interventions, uh, so this is an intervention of around 100 uh, solar PV systems per year for three years, um, beginning in uh, around 2021. Um, uh, just moving back and forth, we can see that the overall impact of that intervention is pretty modest. Uh, one of the key reasons for this is additionality. So. Um, there's little, well, there's, there's good evidence to suggest that um, solar PV programs don't significantly add uh, systems that otherwise would not have been added. So the additionality for um, solar PV programs for unoccupiers, the evidence so far indicates that that's it's not great. And uh, so that means that um, the intervention is not as effective. Um, when we consider that with solar PV on rentals, um, the additionality is really quite good. And uh, the reason being is because, again, we see the very sluggish performance of that marketplace. Uh, now, this highlights another really important point of what we're trying to achieve with interventions. And um, I'll just highlight here. Like when we look at program implementations, we expect that um, the outcome of those programs won't be linear over time necessarily. So with program inception, we would expect um, that a certain time would pass before we'd actually start to see reductions occur in the municipality, which would begin at the actual implementation of those reduction plans. At this stage, uh, we're kind of expecting sort of budget to be hitting around 50%. Um, but there may be other factors involved with that. Um, now, at program completion, we would see that, um, like, there's, uh, we've obviously implemented a large amount of change in the, in the community, but the critical thing that we're really aiming for here is the residual impact, which is the amounts, uh, like, what happens to the market after the program completion. 
is there a legacy, is there continuing change as a result of this program? And when we go back to, say, take a look at um, the, uh, the impact of rentals, the majority of that impact is expected to occur after the conclusion of the program. And the reason being is because the purpose of the program was to restructure the market and to facilitate the market to be able to effectively target the, res uh, the rental sector. So um, we would recommend, and this is one of the reasons why we consider that monitoring and evaluation to be critical and, and it's appropriate to continue it after the program has concluded because understanding how the, um, the market in your municipality is being affected uh, in an ongoing basis as a result of this program will be critical. Essentially, any program that runs for like one, two, three years that doesn't have ongoing implications on the way your market performing is, is unlikely to achieve the scale of change that we need. Uh, the final thing I will discuss is uh, doing an intervention uh, quadrant analysis. This helps to understand like the sort of the potential scale of impacts and the budgets and the return on investment of these um, of the different interventions that could be considered. So uh, the x-axis here is the intervention cost to council, noting that the left side's more expensive and the right side is less expensive. And then the y-axis is the total carbon abated. Now this is a, this is a logarithmic scale, it just sort of increases um, so it gets higher. Uh, by orders of magnitude. Um, and the reason why we use a log scale on that is because there is actually a huge variation in the total expected impacts of different interventions, and this can help sort of show them uh, in, a, in a closer grouping. So this quadrant analysis, we've just broken down into the top, uh, top right corner, is high yield and low cost. So these are the best interventions, the most effective interventions for council to shoot. Um, the uh, high yield, high cost in the top left is um, they are effective, but they are costly. And so um, though, although they should be pursued, really it's only when you would have the budget to allow it. The bottom right, uh, bottom left corner is high, low yield and high cost. These generally are not great strategies to pursue. And um, the bottom right corner, low yield, low cost. So these are strategies that are not particularly problematic to review, though they don't, they may not um, result in um, the type of outcomes we're hoping for. And when we do a breakdown of uh, the type of interventions being considered, um, we can see that there is uh, a fairly big range of performance. The, um, the types of uh, interventions that fall in the green quadrants are ones that councils uh, can exhibit really good leveraging, so very strong capacity um, to influence large amounts of investment in the private sector where there is a very large amount of total emissions associated with that sector. So um, that's industrial clean energy use is a good example. The, um, some of the other examples here uh, say energy efficiency upgrades for existing buildings which fall into that um, orange quadrant. Now that the reason why it's in the orange quadrant is because it, there's a lot of opportunity there but current intervention methods generally are quite high cost and so this is a good point to talk about that. Um, this is a reflective of the cost and effectiveness of interventions. Now, if it was, um, what we're hoping for is that we will continue to learn and uh, experiment with different intervention types. And this will significantly change the layer of this, uh, this table, this graph. So um, exploring different ways to target energy efficiency upgrades for buildings may move that, um, that point to being much closer or inside the green box, the green, green quadrant. And the same could be said for the other intervention types as well. So this is very much contingent on the standard of practice and we are keen to, to iterate towards improvements. So that's uh, me running through that. Obviously there's heaps of additional work there and I'm keen to discuss further. Thanks, um, Matt. Lex. Lex, before we go over to questions, could I just mention that some of those graphs that uh, Matt was talking through were based on some work that we recently did with Central Coast Council in New South Wales. So we'd just like to say thanks to them for uh, letting us use those graphs and also awesome work on jumping on this action planning process so early. Great, thanks Anna. 
Um, we'll jump to questions now and thanks Matt and I'm hoping you can all see these questions again from earlier because we'll start with these and there's some others that have come through and just on that the solar point there are a few people who are mentioning that they're you know undertaking residential solar projects and you know are we suggesting that that shouldn't be done and I guess it's not so much the point but we would suggest reviewing and having a look from here on in because they will be popular projects uh, they're the sort of projects that will win awards they're very visible and so, you know, if you've got other criteria on the, on your mind, then that is totally fine. But again, if you're looking at just the evidence for emissions reduction, the key graph I think is the one where Matt showed the one where we had business as usual, and then we had what happens with the council intervention. And this is based on real data. And I guess the point is there's not really a barrier for residential PV on owner occupied houses. It's easy and it's not really addressing the climate emergency because others are already doing that. Um, we know that Australia is pretty much a laggard when it comes to broad climate action, but we are leading the world when it comes to solar on houses. Um, so the results of those projects aren't necessarily doing anything above business as usual. I think that's the point that's being made there. Well, likewise, with a lot of other projects where um, there might be other fantastic co-benefits, and we go back to the walking school bus one, perhaps it's even more making the point that that's essentially a livability program or it's a program that's trying to get kids active and there might be some co-climate benefits, but it shouldn't be, I guess, talked about as a climate program uh, anymore if we're serious about the challenge at hand. Um, there's a few questions here that I'll, I'm going to jump to and I can run through these really quickly, but otherwise, please keep them coming. What evidence has proved particularly effective in dealing with down, the downplaying of climate change by some councillors? Uh, that's hard. I had a challenge out in Western Sydney last year talking to some councillors about science drive targets and they didn't really even want to accept the science and so I sympathise with that. Um, I would actually suggest looking at the Sustainability Victoria's website. There's a webinar that's on tomorrow. Um, Kate Barker, I think it is, from Minter Ellison, talking about legal risk liabilities. Um, and I would be looking at that webinar. If you can't attend, then they will be putting it online afterwards. She spoke at the Greenhouse Alliance Conference in Victoria last year, and she was absolutely brilliant. Thanks, Claire Dunn just sent through it. Sarah Barker. Um, I don't know Sarah, but I heard her speak, and she's one of the best presenters I've seen in five years. And it's possibly an approach to just scare the shit out of councillors and senior exec. Essentially, they've got fiduciary duties and they will need to act or they can get in a lot of trouble. Um, the calculating the comparative contribution to emissions reductions of central government on decarbonising the grid, um, that's, all, that's all generally incorporated. I think you might be referring to things like emissions coefficients. Um, we would suggest that that is quite standard information that you can find um, and include. Um, the, there will be lots of new technology coming online in the coming 10 years. How have you accounted for this? Um, Matt, Hannah, I might pass that one back to you. Is it, is it accounted for? Give us your 30 second answer unless we have to take it offline. Sure, so um, this is one of the areas that presents complexity for projecting. Um, so there's two broad ways that it's addressed. So um, if a specific action has got uh, some, you know, is of sufficient scale that it can be incorporated. A good example here is EVs. Um, we also look at like batteries and a couple other solutions. Um, then that we can sort of map out a trajectory there. Um, more broadly and like say less, uh, I guess, impactful intervention or solutions um, we incorporate into sort of general trajectories such as um, building efficiencies and the like um, and it may be the case that uh, for large game-changing solutions for which there is no um, like uh, like the the actual uh, implementation timeline is not that known um, then generally we it's not included to date this is um, one of the things that we really want to do, we want to pursue with this, is to be very transparent about the modelling approach and the systems. We want everyone, like we want all the stakeholders to become involved with this, to be able to participate in that conversation. Um, generally, we shy away from assuming, assuming very large scale game changing 
outcomes that solve the problem for us. Um, and because uh, it's, it obviously throws the numbers into somewhat disarray. And if it turns out that this promising solution does not eventuate, then we are in trouble. Thanks. I would I would say, Lex, that in a climate emergency or in any emergency, the response is not to say, hopefully someone will deal with it later. <laughs> That's true, Hannah, and I've, you, I love your analogies on that. Um, there's a related question from Angela. Where does the data on market barriers, market saturation, BAU trajectory come from, particularly given that it is municipality specific? and markets segment specific, you're spot on. Is the time cost effort for collecting this versus investing in other actions warranted? Are there other ways of invest of getting an indication of which actions interventions to take? That is an awesome question. And yeah, the, the, there's basic data, like you can find information, for example, and this again goes back to the whole concept of evidence and experts. And we as a sector spend a lot of time imploring other people to listen to the evidence and we need to do it ourselves. Um, so the, the EV stuff that Matt was talking about before, as far as the barriers to electric vehicles, you go to AVA. So what are they called? The EVA, Electric Vehicle Council or something. Um, and they've got that information and they're the ones that have already done that work. When it comes to more specific things, it does get challenging and it does require some time on the council's behalf to know and ask the right questions. And I think Hannah gave some examples there, uh, Liverpool and... I think Wollongong with, you know, you've got the largest emitter in Australia in your municipality. Hobson's Bay is another similar one, for example, we talk about a bit because they're a bit of an outlier and good to provide an analogy or an example. They've got ExxonMobil. What's important to know about that is not just how big they are, but what they're doing. For example, Exxon in the US is currently looking at selling Exxon in Australia. They are really struggling at the moment with their social license to operate. And so having an understanding of what that's going to mean to industrial emissions is pretty important. Uh, Hannah, did you want to jump in there? Time, cost, effort for collecting this, having just gone through it, is it worth it? Um, and, um, or do you just you know, get an indication of the actions and do it, which I'd suggest is just not evidence-based action planning? Hannah? Um, yeah, I mean, I would, I would say that whilst we're running through this in a lot of detail and explaining our process in a lot of detail, we're certainly not proposing that this should be an exhaustive and, and a very, very um, limiting process in terms of the time and cost that we spend on collecting this data. There is so much data out there. We already have so much of this already. And it's simply making sure that we apply the knowledge that we have, that we seek the best information, apply it to the municipality, apply it to the specific emissions profile and the specific context, and use that to make decisions about how we move forward. Um, this is not, the, no one is suggesting that it should be um, any longer or more complicated than that and and whilst we go through it in a lot of detail the actual process in terms of running through the project in terms of running through the planning process is quite streamlined and um and 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 not very long okay. at all either. good good to hear no, good to know that. thank you hang on matt i'm just going to keep going here um there's questions around encouraging community behavior change to reduce energy use uh, which have higher acceptance to convert to action. I guess it's not so much the, the focus here, but there is a lot out there. So behaviour change networks and, and advice. I'd suggest it's probably not the barrier. Um, and especially you might find looking at your own snapshot, but residential energy use is not the, the big one. Um, climate change is an organisation that I um, serve on the, the board for. And we, we, as we look at this sort of stuff as well in how you actually have conversations. And so I'll just give them a little plug because they're an awesome organisation, but there are lots of others out there like that. Mackenzie Moore is a name worth looking up around behaviour change. Um, another council, another question around the role councils can play in expediating required energy transmission and DB upgrades for renewable energy, electrification and EVs. Um, I think, Chris, I know what you're up to, what you're talking about here, but this involves um, advocacy and relationship with distribution businesses. Um, so um, advocacy to AMO, AMC and the AER. And I can tell you in Victoria, for example, the Greenhouse Alliances are having this exact discussion in three hours time um, 
how they go about um, answering that question. Um, let's see if I've got one or two more questions here that I can quickly get to. Are there any there that you want to jump on? Do you consider environmental impacts? And this will have to be a really ultra quick one. Matt or Hannah, how bushfires, flood and drought may change the BAU of actions as they increase in the coming years? I guess a quick yes or no and a 10 second response. Uh, not in detail. So we, we look at trends um, and so specific like uh, emergency like events are, are not currently incorporated into the trend. Um, we are taking into account uh, general, like so in these trends, um, characteristics such as, you know, changing housing sizes, changing urban density, things like that are accommodated, which are probably secondary effects of a lot of this. Great. Net zero 2050 is generally agreed. What is the generally agreed science-based 2030 target? Hannah, you got a good answer to this the other day. <laughs> oh dear, I can't really remember it. Do you want me to um, help you? Look, <laughs> yeah, you go ahead, Lex. It can mean a lot of different things. It depends on whether you're looking at converging and you know contracting and how you actually try and get to that target. It's a really interesting discussion. Our take is that um, you use carbon budgets and then it's a matter of overlaying plausible interventions and, and targets. Paris doesn't say zero by 2050. It says under two and, you know, ideally one and a half degrees. And then it's the IPCC that says this is the, the carbon budget. And whenever we do the modelling um, and develop these carbon budgets for councils and give them trajectories, I mean, generally you need to get to zero in 15 to 20 years and that's for two degrees. One and a half degrees can't really be done without drawdown because we've already at 1.3 degrees, um, it's pretty straightforward to undertake that analysis, um, if you like. Uh, one last question here around advocacy and the importance of advocacy. I might, we've, we disagree a bit with the nine bark about this. My personal take is it's incredibly important, and I look at what councils can do around advocating for those big changes behind the scenes. Um, you won't get the kudos that you will for solar on homes, but if you can do things like you know, make sure that Liddell closes a bit easier or have a say in closing your Hazelwood or looking at EPA limits on coal-fired power stations, that reduces the overall emissions coefficients, the intensity, the carbon intensity of the grid, and that actually does make really significant reductions in emissions. Um, all right, what we always do in these webinars is that we gather those questions that didn't get answered today, and there were a lot, um, and also those that were, we said we probably would not even get to today because they weren't um, as pertinent, but we will develop a report probably a week away, it's a bit going on this week, um, and send them through to you. Um, as I did mention though, here they are again, a lot of these concepts and some of these very fascinating slides and graphs and documents that go through and explain BAU and then where you actually can intervene to make a difference are available post webinar. Um, we want feedback though. And we really love feedback and please feel free to give us constructive criticism. If you think we're being too technical, or too wordy, tell us, too monotone, tell us. Um, constructive criticism is really welcome. We're quite happy to also have an open mind with that because we want to make sure what we're doing is hitting the mark. If you think it's awesome or life-changing or inspirational, then of course, please tell us that. So. Um, but I will send an email instead of getting it through the usual sort of go-to webinar channels. It's just going to come from my email address um, with a questionnaire. You, you answer it, it'll take you a minute, and then you get the slides and you get that report. Let me thank Hannah and Matt for their presentations from down in Tassie today. I've had some feedback here that the audio has been good, so thank you. We did try and fix that one. Um, for those that are going to the Climate Emergency Summit on Friday and Saturday morning, uh, I will see you there and a few others. And for those that have missed out, you can still buy online or virtual tickets now. So you can see whatever you like that way. We did record this webinar. So for those that missed it or colleagues, if you do think it's valuable, uh, we'll try and get that out as soon as possible. Otherwise, thank you again for the attendance um, and the attention. And we will catch you soon. Bye.